Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. This is Dennis and today I'm talking with Mark on uh, nutrition and critically ill patients. How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing well, Dennis. Thank you for inviting me back. I appreciate it. Now, obviously, uh, we usually have you on for surgical uh, type topics, but I think another really important part of that is beyond the resuscitation, beyond the wound care, the antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at some point, you may have to feed this patient, and um, sometimes our patients, they, they don't get evacuated. We're just Nobody is going to come get them. And I'd like to start talking about what do we do uh, beyond this time, okay? So the, the first thing I'd like to talk about is nutrition. Um, so kind of jumping into it, you know, what is the importance of nutrition in your critically ill or injured patients? Uh, great question, uh, Dennis, and it's a it's a question that uh, everybody needs to deal with. It doesn't matter if you're in some austere environment uh, or in a level one trauma center or in some type of support hospital. And nutrition, uh, really, one of the big things is energy and healing, and uh, and so I think the the importance of that cannot be uh, overstated. Um, so. Uh, I'm really glad you brought this topic to light. It's something that we all deal with. So, you know, no, normally, you know, any of our interventions that we do, there's nothing that's free, right? Everything has good and bad sides to it. Um, what is, what are the good and bad going along with starting to feed a, a an injured patient, a critically in, injured patient? Right. Um, what are the pros and cons to, to feeding an injured patient? Um, it, it really depends on where these injuries are. Um, so in other words, uh, injuries to the gut, meaning the elementary canal, meaning the stomach, the small bowel, the intestines, if you will. Um, and <clears throat> those are, those are patients that have their own challenges when, when feeding. And uh, I'll get back to that in a second. But then there's the other patients with, uh, that don't affect um, the intake and output of nutrition and waste, um, such as injuries to the extremities, uh, burns, for instance, uh, and head injuries, which have their own unique uh, requirements when it comes to nutrition. So let's start off simple, and we'll say, how will, how will nutrition affect uh, and the pros and cons of feeding somebody uh, of an extremity injury. Well, I don't think you're really going to find very many cons in feeding somebody with an extremity injury um, other than if, say, they're a diabetic. And then you have to weigh uh, the carbohydrates which you deliver. Um, but other than that, take away that, all things being equal, you want to get any critically injured uh, patient nutrition as soon as possible. And that's all based on metabolic demand. And by metabolic demand, I largely mean energy expenditure, not, not in terms of running a race, but in terms of cellular metabolism. So I don't want to get caught in the weeds. Uh, that won't help your listeners at all. Uh, but basically delivering protein and fats to your patient so that they can convert these uh, proteins and fats uh, to long-term energy and what that means to that patient is healing. In other words, how quickly can they heal that stump? How quickly can they overcome a potential infection? And things like avoiding uh, decubitus ulcers, for instance, and pneumonias. And all that has to do with delivering uh, nutrition in a timely fashion. Critically ill patients who have injuries, uh, say, from burns, uh, burns probably have the highest metabolic demand of all patients. These patients are compromised for any number of reasons, which your listeners know, such as temperature regulation and infection. And again, delivering these patients uh, nutrition early is, is very, very important. Their metabolic demands are multiple times higher uh, 
than uh, not only a healthy patient, uh, but also um, even, you know, highly tuned athletes and so forth. But say they're just, uh, you know, indigent people, um, you still need to deliver uh, high qual high, high uh, calorie nutrition, again, in the forms of fats and, and proteins to these patients uh, early and, and often. Um, and then the head injury is, is very similar. The head injured and the burns patient, these patients, uh, again, the highest metabolic demands uh, of all your patients, of all your injuries, and these patients need to be fed as well. And when I talk about feeding in these patients, in general, unless I say otherwise, it means orally or enterally, if you will. Um, now, there are times when you may not be able to feed them in the mouth, they may be unconscious, and, and you still need to get nutrition in, and that you can do in the form of tubes, right? Mm -hmm either nasoenteric, nasogastric uh, tubes uh, that go either through the nose or through the mouth into the esophagus and down into the stomach. And uh, in general, that's how you would feed these patients who are unable to be conscious enough to eat on their own. There are pluses and minuses with these tubes, and maybe that addresses part of your question, who and when can you feed? Um, and, uh, these patients really need to have their head elevated. We talk about having their head elevated about 30 degrees. If you can't feed them with their head elevated, they have a very high risk of aspiration. These tubes keep the esophagus open and they will reflux. All patients reflux and aspirate to some degree. And for the amount of volume you need to instill in these patients, again, mostly in the terms of proteins and fats. And remember, these are the ones that your stomach keeps around longer. Uh, it won't empty as quickly um, with proteins and fats in them. These are the ones that have a higher potential for aspiration. Now, in a hospital, for instance, we can get that tube into the jejunum, which is um, that second part of the small intestine, the first part being the duodenum. Um, and these patients who are being fed directly into the jejunum have an exceedingly low risk of aspiration. Probably not something that uh, you can do with prolonged field care. Uh, you have to be, or you should be at a hospital. Once in a while, you can get lucky and a tube will um, make its way into the jejunum through peristalsis. But I don't know that a lot of folks carry a, a tube long enough to, to reach that area. So again, in general, uh, for our conversation, we're talking about a tube that just goes into the stomach, and uh, and that's what we would call enteral feeding if they can't eat on their own. Um, and I think those are the – so we talked about head injuries, burns, uh, and extremities. And then there's, there's uh, pluses and minuses in patients who can be fed directly into the gut. Now – <clears throat> Again, very, very few minuses feeding patients into the gut uh, and injuries to the um, abdomen. Um, however, there are patients that you may have who have uh, things that are called fistula. And a fistula, for our purposes here, are where the intestine, uh, whether it be the small bowel or the colon, uh, are uh, emptying. Uh, onto the surface of the skin. And this generally happens with penetrating injuries um, and uh, the healing takes place where there is a leak from the intestine which uh, wears its way into the atmosphere. And that's what we would call an entero or colo, colon, uh, atmospheric fistula. So an enteroatmospheric fistula, a coloatmospheric fistula, same thing as an enterocutaneous fistula or a colocutaneous fistula. So I'll go over that slowly again. You have a penetrating wound to the abdomen. We can say a stab wound or you can say a gunshot wound. <clears throat> the patient uh, does not succumb to the wound itself and over time, meaning a matter of days, uh, the bowel whether it's small or large, leaks onto the surface of the skin. If you were to feed these patients in an austere environment, so 
you cannot evacuate this patient in three to five days, but now you're sitting on them. Uh, maybe they're coalition forces uh, or something along that nature, and you can't operate on them. Uh, it's, to, it's impossible to evacuate them for whatever the reason. And all of a sudden, you see a either foul-smelling or foul-looking material leak through the skin. These are fistula, and if you feed them, you get more output. Why is that bad? That's bad because, A, it's horrific for the skin. It breaks down the skin, and it makes a small wound a big wound. And, two, you're losing a lot of fluid. And if it's, if it's small bowel fluid, you're losing a lot of nutrients, meaning you're losing vitamins, minerals, salts, and, uh, and digestive enzymes and, and uh, digestive detergents, if you will. In other words, bile. Mm -hmm which breaks down fats and so forth. So um, it's really deleterious to get a fistula. Even in the best of situations, the morbidity and mortality can be almost unreasonably high. And if that occurs in a austere environment, um, you could, uh, you know, th these patients would just will not do well. Right. Well, that's definitely a lot more complicated than I thought. I was just thinking of aspiration risk. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, at, at uh, many academic centers, uh, these patients spend a long time uh, potentially in the ICU and also on the floor. And you come up with very various means of dealing with these fistula. Some, and one way is to feed them through their veins or, or their IVs, if you will. We call that parenteral nutrition or total parenteral nutrition. Um, or uh, they go back to surgery and you try and repair it. And um, you certainly can do that, and it's certainly been successful. But uh, just like life, uh, when you do choose to take these patients back to the operating room to repair a fistula, timing is everything. So, And that has to deal with anticipating inflammation, anticipating its ending, uh, and, and, uh, and then a very, very patient surgeon who, uh, who is willing to care for that patient because that patient and you, uh, have just formed, uh, sometimes in, an albatross like bond, uh, for weeks, okay. uh, potentially months. So other than, you know, fistulas, uh, potential for aspiration, um, you mentioned sitting up the head of the bed. Um, obviously you're talking about just the shoulders, not their actual head, but, um, I mean, does that, by sitting them up, does that alleviate the risk or for aspiration? Yeah, so, um, so does it alleviate it? It doesn't mitigate it. It doesn't make it zero. Um, it decreases the risk, Okay. right? So you and I aspirate um, all night long, right? Mm -hmm. And But these, th that's micro-aspiration, and that tends not to affect us in the least. We're talking about uh, aspiration such as, um, more than water brash, uh, more like vomitus, meaning um, the lower esophageal sphincter is a physiologic sphincter. It's not a true sphincter. And so it opens and closes uh, throughout, you know, the day and evening and so forth. Um, and uh, it won't prevent boluses of fluid um, from going up the esophagus and then into your oral pharynx and then being aspirated in a bolus versus the micro aspiration you and I do when it's just, you know, a little bit of spit here and there. And being intubated or trached does not prevent that. Um, I still hear it even today in 2020 and, and, and so forth where people say, well, they were trached, you know, I want to trach them or I want to intubate them so they don't aspirate. Well, that doesn't fly. Right. <laughs> they still will aspirate despite an inflated balloon. Okay. And so um, the pressures at which you would occlude um, the esophagus or the trachea are unreasonable uh, to use that as a mechanism to prevent aspiration. So, yes, getting back to what you were saying, raising the head of the bed and the common goal 
um, is 30 degrees. So greater than, you know, greater than 29 degrees and less than 60 degrees is generally the accepted elevation of the, I said head, you said shoulders, and I, I like the way you said that better than I do. Um, I think raising the torso um, to a 30 degree uh, or greater than 30 degree uh, altitude would be the, the goal. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's lots to do when you have this this patient and, and feeding them is way down the list, right? Um, before we even, you know, are honestly considering feeding a patient, kind of what, what things, I mean, obviously we're talking beyond March, right? But what kind of things do we have to have under control uh, before we could even consider, you know, feeding this patient? So um, what kind of things do you have under control? So I'm thinking Assuming like, you've uh, made it through money. Yeah. I'm thinking like, you know, resuscitation is done. Um, you know, things like that. So, uh, yeah, you bring up a good consideration. Um, so resuscitation, the patient, uh, really should be resuscitated. I suppose in some way you could say nutrition is part of the resuscitation. But remember, if the cells are starving, if they're literally starving to death, and when I mean cells are starving, I'm talking more elemental. I'm talking about oxygen. I'm talking about flow. Um, and uh, nutrition won't do any good and it will do potential harm if you try and put proteins and fats uh, in somebody's gut, uh, gut meaning basically the stomach and small bowel, if you try and, and put these types of uh, heavy molecules, if you will, heavy type of nutrition in there, um, the body won't use it. So you have to establish flow. You have to resuscitate the patient. And once that is, once that is done, um, then uh, you can start uh, feeding them. So, uh, you know, the, the, the regular things like airway and hemorrhage and stuff, that has, to be, that has to be taken care of. And in general, in general, uh, we want to start nutrition within 24 to 36 hours of um, a critical injury or a critical illness. Okay. Now, in a previous podcast, like, I think like, you know, podcasts like, five or six, right? Our very early ones. Um, you know, they're mentioning that there's no need to feed our patients, at least the, the trauma patients that they were talking about at that time, um, for at least like a week, that there, there won't be any harm for waiting that long. Um, but this is really why I wanted to start talking about it, because in, in the hospital systems, you know, they're talking about, it's like you said, within 24 hours feeding this patient, um, so I guess what is what's the harm that will come from waiting beyond that time? Waiting beyond so, the twenty four hours, thirty six hours, and waiting right. those couple of days. Right. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know who said that. Um, uh, every podcast that I've listened to of yours has a more than qualified, a super qualified person. Um, uh, you know, leading that podcast with you. Mm -hmm. So um, I will tell you that again, in 2020, uh, you're hearing both. You're hearing um, that uh, we don't need to feed this patient right away. In other words, um, you know, even recently I had a patient and it's, I was caring for somebody else's patient who had a perforated uh, gastric uh, or gastroduodenal ulcer. And, uh, in my practice, if I do that and I'm operating on them, I put a feeding tube in them and I start feeding them right away. Um, meaning, uh, maybe not that day, uh, because they, I just want to make sure they're resuscitated. Uh, but I will feed them, uh, within 12 to 24 hours because I have direct access to their, to their gut because I put a feeding tube in at the time of surgery, not a surgical feeding tube, but a nasoenteric uh, mm -hmm. feeding tube. Um, and the reason why I do that is because patients need to heal. Uh, 
they, we need to deliver enough energy for them to heal, both from a metabolic standpoint and, quite honestly, a clinical standpoint. So uh, sometimes, you know, we're gilding the lily. Sometimes we're threading the needle uh, by doing these things because they're the right thing to do along with, you know, 10 other things. What I'm talking about is there is, there is a clinical benefit, meaning a measurable benefit for these patients uh, if you feed them early. And yes, you will find some people, uh, both newly trained and trained years ago, who feel that you don't need to feed these patients for five to seven days. And, and you know what, if they come in healthy, if they're a, a, you know, a 23 year old or even a 30 year old and potentially a 40 year old, can they, can you starve their body? Um, you know, for five to seven days? Um, and the answer is, yeah, of course you can. And if they come in healthy, they've been eating, um, their nutrition was optimized prior to whatever event that brought them in, will they do okay? And the answer is yes, a majority of, will do okay. And there's a minority who will not do okay. They'll have prolonged hospital stays. They'll have complications. Maybe they'll have one, maybe they'll have two, maybe they'll have three, um, and they will pay for it. So, um, like everything else we do, uh, probably in life, I was going to say in medicine, but probably in life, there's, like you said, there's risks and benefits. And I tell my patients exactly what, what you brought up is that everything we do and everything we don't do carries risk. And it just depends on what side of that risk you want to be on. So for 20 bucks, I put a feeding tube in and for another 20 bucks for, uh, you know, maybe a day I give them uh, nutrition and I, I rarely, if ever see, um, any risk, uh, I shouldn't say that. I rarely, if ever have seen any deleterious or adverse event come from feeding my perforated ulcers early or I shouldn't even say early, timely, within 12 to 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So what do you do about your, your you know, soldier that gets injured downrange uh, or, or coalition forces or, or you know, families or, or indigent, indigent people there who, who are injured that you're caring for? Uh, and the answer is, um, if you have the means, I would go ahead and feed them. Yep. All things being equal, all these risks we talked about and, and the knowledge and the ability to feed them. If you have a choice between feeding and not feeding, you feed them within 24 to 36 hours. And if you don't, it's a risk and uh, you may get away with it. But if they are not nutritionally replete, if they're not resuscitated uh, and you wait that five to seven days, um, somebody's going to pay the piper whether it's the patient or the patient and the surgeon or the patient and the medic or the patient and the nurse, they're, they're going to go, they're going to bring you with them. They're going to bring you down with them because nutrition is the currency of healing. Yeah, no, very good. You know, I mean, and obviously we're talking about the medical benefits of this. I mean, there's also a logistical side. There's, you know, there are many other aspects of it. And whether, you know, one medic decides to do it or not to do it, he's going to have to make that decision, um, taking all the factors into play um, to actually come up with what's the right thing to do. So that might be another plug for telemedicine. Um, if you're thinking about doing it, uh, it's probably worth the call. I think if you're getting down to should I feed him or not, uh, things probably are fairly calm. Um where you have time to go ahead and call somebody to make sure you've got all your ducks in a row before you start pushing fluid or part, some kind of feeding uh, formula. And, and you've heard me speak a lot about proteins and fats uh, because they are so important for nutrition. Uh, but at its basic element, carbohydrates, um, and we're not necessarily talking about refined sugar and, and stuff like that. But, 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 you know, whether it's fructose, uh, or glucose, um, that's still energy. It's, it's kind of empty energy, uh, but it's still energy. 
And if you're in a jam, it's, it's not a bad thing. And some people would argue potentially it's a good thing. It'll keep for a time. Uh, it will keep your body from breaking down its own fats and, and proteins uh, and selectively using the glucose that you're, you're feeding the body through the veins, for instance, like your D5s and D10s. Um, it, you know, it would, it would selectively use that energy uh, first. Now, it won't be providing the necessary elements, amino acids and so forth, or protein building, but remember, um, in in the early phases of healing, you're catabolic, and I think that's an important uh, understanding for medics, non medics, uh, anybody who's caring for a critically ill patient uh, at home or away. Is you are catabolic, and there's really very little you can do to make these patients anabolic. And what I mean by catabolic. Is you're constantly breaking down, uh, the body is constantly breaking down its its fats and proteins, um, and uh, and using all of those for for energy um, in the initial phases of critical illness, and it's not so farther on down the road where the body becomes anabolic. We all think of anabolism or anabolic uh, like steroids, you know, like football players and athletes, performance enhancing drugs, stuff like that. But anabolic just means that you're, the body's putting itself back together. And, um, and so what can we do in those early phases? And, uh, you know, we've looked at uh, supplying patients with testosterone and its synthetic analogs, oxandrolone and so forth, human growth hormone. And really, these, these um, have provided some benefit in pediatric patients and adult patients. We haven't seen the outcomes in converting our catabolic, critically ill patients into an anabolic patient. Mm-hmm. And so you get this muscle wasting. And along with that, you get the cubitus ulcers and things like that, which are, are really um, uh, a problem, both uh, from a wound uh, aspect as well as a protective barrier for infection. I remember Christopher Reeve, he died from an infected uh, decubitus ulcer. Um, and, uh, and so getting these patients anabolic is very difficult. And really the only anabolic hormone, if you will, um, during the early phases that we all have and have access to is insulin. But insulin has its own uh, issues when delivering that exogenously. Mm-hmm. Uh, as well. So this uh, catabolic state, is that from the stress response or uh, is it just a combination of the inflammatory response and kind of all these things? I guess I'm trying to think when we in medicine, you know, try and force the body to change from what it's doing, um, mm-hmm. it's either very difficult or impossible or it ends up with a really bad outcome. I'm wondering right. if, if it's not a uh, the body doesn't do that on purpose to make it catabolic so that it it reprioritizes the thing, I guess, functions within so, the body. Yeah, no, I like the way you think about it, and I like the way you're, you're asking me to clarify that uh, because it, 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 it is not, the body does do it on purpose. The body absolutely does it on purpose, um, you know, analogous to like cancer, right? Cancer is just, healing over and over and over again in an uncontrollable fashion. And the body does that on purpose, even though it doesn't really make sense because eventually uh, that cancer kills the body. So it's, it's not uh, beneficial. So let's move away from cancer entirely and understand that the inflammatory state uh, and the catabolic process, they go hand in hand. It, in the end, it doesn't. Um, the body is is trying to harness all the energy that's available, whether it's exogenous energy, meaning getting fed, exogenous meaning outside the body, so um, getting fed through feeding tubes or orally or parenterally through the vein, um, anything that's available. And so if it can't get enough energy from that standpoint, 
exogenously, then it's going to turn on itself and it's going to rob the body for energy, glucose, glycogen stores uh, from uh, muscle and fat and, and, you know, and the organs, the liver, it's going to do whatever it can so that it can restore itself to its original milieu, milieu meaning, you know, mixture of things. Uh, where the body was in a more or less a homeostatic state. Mm -hmm. So all of that is fancy garbage words for saying the body's just trying to get to where it started from. Right. And, uh, and in order to do that, it's going gonna, it's gonna to use whatever's available, whether it's food or the, the, the substrate of the body itself, meaning muscle and fat. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark, you sold me. Um, on this patient, um, I'd like to, I'd like to feed him. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I think, you know, I'm hearing bowel sounds, uh, the patient's passing gas. Um, so I think I'm thinking that he, he can accept it. Um, I guess. So how, how do I go about setting this up? I, I don't have the, the ability to, you know, could, could we take a step before that? I, sure. I hate to interrupt you, Dennis. That's right. Um, but um, I do want to hit on a couple of things that, that you just brought up just now. And you said that the patient has uh, bowel sounds and they're, and they're passing flatus. Mm -hmm. um, so from a, from a more or less an academic standpoint, so for, number one, bowel sounds, they come from the stomach and they come from the colon. Okay. So what you're, I think, referring to is they don't have an ileus. And an ileus, in its most layman terms, is when the body goes, the, the gut goes to sleep, right? Right. And so, which is a little different than uh, uh, a gastric ileus or gastroparesis, meaning that the stomach itself has fallen asleep, meaning, and all this means is that there's no peristalsis in the gut, right? Mm -hmm. And peristalsis is the natural locomotion of aboral feeding. In other words, from the mouth to the anus, if you will. Okay. So when, when we take a bolus of food, um, say a hamburger, we chew it, right? And we macerate it and it goes down uh, the esophagus into the stomach. The stomach turns solid into liquid. That's what it does. And it keeps things around until it gets it liquid. And, uh, and then it sends it down to the duodenum, which has enormous absorptive capacity. And uh, from the duodenum, it goes down the small bowel through multiple feet of small bowel. And uh, certain nutrients are pulled into the, into the intestine, into the lining of the intestine, and then eventually into the bloodstream and onto the liver. Um, and, and then anything else becomes waste, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, that waste now enters in a liquefied form into the colon. And in the right side of the colon, um, that liquid waste starts to become solid. So your colon's responsibility is basically to be a big bag to hold solid waste and, and to absorb water. I think that's what your audience needs to understand. And I'm sure most of them understand this and I'm merely repeating, uh, what they know. So, um, so I would ask you, um, if you have a patient who is distended and passing gas, would you feed them? And many of us probably would not. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if, it, and if they're distended and they have bowel sounds, would you feed them? And again, many of us probably would not. Well, what would you do if they were not distended and they don't have bowel sounds? Well, a lot of us probably would feed them. Okay. Not everybody. Some, some people are married to bowel sounds and married to flatus. So what I pose to you and our, and, and our audience is um, there, there has to be some clinical intuition here. And, um, and if we know that bowel sounds come from the stomach and they come from the colon, um, that doesn't mean that the small bowel, which is critical in absorbing all these 
nutrients is awake and working. We just don't know that. Right. And we teach dogmatically and it's probably true. Um, but, but I don't, I can't tell you it's true all the time that, um, the, the elementary tract, if you will, um, comes back in a more or less a predictable manner. And the stomach tends to be last. The small bowel tends to be first and somewhere in there, the colon wakes up and and that works. So now that we have all this information, um, how do we know when to feed our patients? And so I think that's where this process of, well, if they have bowel sounds and they're passing flatus, we can feed them. And that's not always true. So again, that goes into your risk benefit uh, cost analysis equation of should we feed our patients? Okay. And the more sedentary our patients are, the more they're lying down and not doing anything, the more likely they are to develop this ileus, this gastroparesis. And uh, certainly if we're feeding them aborally through the mouth and expecting it to go downstream, um, uh, and then we would expect that their stomach would be the very last and may even go to sleep for a long time. And that would be quite problematic. So again, it's a, it's a cost benefit um, thing that, that your, your medic um, and those caring for that patient along with a medic will have to have to make a determination whether they can feed them or not. Okay. And, and flatus, the, the best way, the, the one point that I do want to make uh, and I think we're learning more and more uh, is that the best way to keep the gut working uh, is to feed it. And so to avoid an ileus, I will feed a patient. In other words, that, that's one of the reasons why I feed my patients early. If you stimulate the gut, if you, if you really want to stimulate the gut, feed them uh, as high as you can, meaning hopefully orally, mm-hmm. but if you can't feed them orally, feed them in the stomach and that will keep the gut awake. Does it work a hundred percent? No, there's never always, and there's never, never. Right. And so, um, stimulate that gut and feed them. And the body's largest immunomodulatory organ, meaning the, our body's most important, strongest, largest organ that helps prevent infection uh, is the gut, is a small bowel. Hmm. And so that's why it's important to keep the bowel happy. And you keep it happy by feeding them. So if you're not using bowel sounds and or flatulence or, you know, uh, actually, uh, you know, having some kind of fecal matter come out, um, what other exams are you doing to kind of assess that small bowel? Is it just your abdominal exam or? Great question, uh, Dennis. And, and really, uh, if that's the message that I've conveyed, it's, it's slightly erroneous. In other words, um, it's part of the equation. Okay. These are, these are all data points. Right. And so what I, what I want to convey is, um, you can't, you can't solely rely on one data point. You can't rely on bowel sounds and flatus. You can't rely on flatus. You can't rely on bowel sounds. You have to look and see, is the patient distended or oh, not? Okay. Yeah. Um, is the patient able to eat or not? Do they have, are they hungry or do they have an appetite? Mm-hmm. Right? So hungry means, you know, basically are they starving or not? Appetite just means there's a sensation of uh, food uh, have um, a response? You know, are they, is there something that they, they want in particular? Do they want a payday, a Babe Ruth, you know, a, a vegetable, a fruit, um, or a steak, you know? And, uh, and so the, these, are, these are things that you can use to evaluate whether they're ready to eat or not. Not everybody, you know, and you can't just use those either. I've had plenty of trauma patients that you say, whatever you do, do not eat. We'll feed you tomorrow. We'll feed you in a couple of days. And yet they find some way of conning some 
nurse or tech or friend from home to bring them food and it's it's not a good outcome right so it's it's all those things together and that's why your medics are medics that's why our nurses are helpful and you know everybody gets a say and has an opinion uh, ultimately somebody's going to have to make a decision but sometimes the patient uh isn't cooperative or or just uh tries to override those decisions right Okay. Um, so I mean, just looking at myself, I have never, I, other than patients who have said I am hungry, um, and they've, I know that they've been resuscitated and their mental status is great and and things like that. Like, okay, here, I'll I'll get you a snack. Um, other than people like that, I've never had to feed anybody who's been unconscious and and, and in a critical, critically injured. Right. Right. Um, so let's say, you know, we get to warm and fuzzy, like we have this critical patient. Uh, he's, been, he's been severely injured, um, but we're, we're, uh, we're leaning on the side of we'd like to feed him, okay? We think it's safe to at least attempt it. Um, we have an NG tube because the patient cannot talk or, um, or indicate he's not aware enough. What do, what do you feed him? I mean, I don't have pre-made yeah. um, solution, right? Right. So um, you do your best to get something that will pass through that tube that won't clog the tube. That's the that's my best answer. So um, my guess is uh, not everybody's carrying a blender. Not everybody's carrying around uh, um, a coffee bean uh, crusher. Um, but you, you try and find some type of, uh, sustenance that can be passed in liquid form down that tube. And you may have to, you know, go through trial and error. In other words, you know, things like we talk about the brat diet, right? A very Mm -hmm. elemental diet. Um, and quite honestly that the, um, this is getting into another topic, uh, which, um, in general, it's, it's called hypocaloric feeding. Mm-hmm. Um, or trophic feeding. People love to toss around the word trophic feeding. And for the longest time, years and years and years, we use trophic feeding. That was, that was something to make us clinicians, surgeons, medicine doctors, intensivists, whatever you want to call us, uh, is uh, we used to use that term, make us feel good. Well, finally, they came up with kind of a definition for trophic feeding, and that was somewhere between 50% and two-thirds of our caloric needs. Right. And so, uh, we would say, ah, just feed them trophic feeds. And so, you know, you compare, um, you know, some, you know, 300, you know, 280 pound lean door crusher and you compare, um, you know, some administrator, uh, those two body habituses and what's trophic for them? Well, I don't know. And does it really matter in that initial phase of nutrition? And so my answer uh, to, to you, Dennis, uh, for your question is, I start off really low, really slow, and I give them hypocaloric feeds. Um, and uh, hypocaloric feeds, meaning just a bare minimum, just to where the fluid is colored. You know, so whether it's, uh, you know, bananas that have been, you know, pounded down into liquid with a little bit of D5 or, or just maybe plain water. And if it's down a tube, maybe, maybe normal saline is fine. Um, just not a lot, you know, just something to liquefy and make it thin enough to pass through that tube. And for 24 hours, it's going down that tube somewhere between, you know, you pick a number between 10 and 20 milliliters an hour. Okay. And again, that's probably just enough to stimulate the gut. So if we look at hypocaloric feeds or trophic feeds, if you will, um, is there any benefit to that? And the answer is, yeah, we, yes, we think so. The nutrition literature is full of point counterpoint. For every paper you find pro, you'll find at least one or two con. And we go in circles a lot, and I think we fall on the best practice, most logical guidelines 
uh, for that. And I know I introduced you to the Aspen guidelines. Um, and in Europe, they're the ESPEN guidelines, the uh, American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition, or in Europe, the European uh, Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. And this will give you, um, you know, the best evidence to date, and the guidelines are like any other guidelines, the majority chest pounders and table pounders um, write these guidelines and uh, have, you know, recommendations based on, um, you know, level of evidence and, and uh, grade of recommendation to, to proceed with, you know, whatever it is you're looking for. So um, your patient that you presented uh, would get, you know, some type of bananas and who knows, maybe, maybe rice and, you know, toast and whatever you can macerate or liquefy and get down that tube uh, at a very low rate for the initial, you know, 24 hours or so, maybe it's 48, just to make sure that the gut's working. And if they do aspirate, um, you're there for them, you, you know, it's time, you know what to expect, you're doing the basics, like you said, the torso's elevated, you're doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're unconscious, they won't be able to tell you that they're nauseated, uh, but if they're, if they're, you know, abdomen gets distended, um, you know, to stop and you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And eventually, you know, things will happen. They may, uh, pass gas. They may have a stool, um, things like that. Okay. So, so it's not critical that you get them to their goal nutrition right away. Feeding them, you know, that 50% to two thirds, uh, in, you know, the next, several days is perfectly adequate and you're it may be trial and error. Some days are good. Some days are not, uh, you know, getting them to be up and moving if at all possible is, is enormous. That's really good. Um, and, uh, and if you can't, uh, at least you're providing the basic elements and you're actually barely providing any elements in that first 24 to 48 hours. 24 to 36, what have you, mm -hmm. uh, when you're giving them that very little 10 to 20 milliliters an hour of some type of nutrition. Okay. So you don't just go straight for the uh, protein powder down the tube? No. Um, you know, protein powder is another way of giving, you know, really good uh, nutrition. What's going to happen is, is if your patient, for instance, uh, has not been fed, say, in that five to seven days, um, the remember the small bowel under a microscope looks like a shag carpet, uh, mm -hmm. a healthy small bowel. Now, if you looked at that small bowel under the microscope, uh, in that kind of seven to 14 day mark, that shag carpet has gone to indoor outdoor carpet to basically, a um, a, uh, a, a, um, smooth floor, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so without the absorptive capacity, of that shag carpet, uh, the proteins and fats will, uh, not only will they not be absorbed, but your patient will have the squitters. Okay. They will, they will put out volumes of stool. And with that, they lose all kinds of electrolytes. They lose potassium and, uh, and, and probably arguably more importantly, they lose the ability to retain fluid mm -hmm. and they become dehydrated. And that's obviously very bad. So if you feed your patient proteins and fats right away after a prolonged fasting period, um, you're, you're really going to run into problems with electrolytes and, and fluids. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The other now, thing that, that, you, that I just, yeah, I was going to say we starting off at 10 to 20 milliliters an hour. Um, I mean, do you increase from there? Say, you know, 12, 24 hours later, like things are going just fine. Do I go up um, or do I just keep yeah. it to maintain? Do I maintain that for, and then change the, the contents of that feed or do I, do I increase the volume of that feed? How do I adjust fire and how do I assess um, that I'm moving in the right direction? Well, here's the good news, Dennis. Uh, the good news is it's all style points from here on out. 
So you go to one hospital and their uh, protocol, if you will, is to go up by uh, 10 milliliters every four hours until you reach goal. And you go to another hospital and it's go up by 20, 20 milliliters an hour until you reach goal. And you go to another hospital and they say, go to three quarter strength and then full strength. And they have some variation. What that tells us is we don't know. Okay. <laughs> so again, it's trial and error. It's style over substance. And, um, and depending on your patient's needs. So a burn patient, you know, tends to need a lot of fluid. I would be giving, pushing more towards uh, increasing fluid um, then I would say um, a patient who um, has a bad crush injury and got a massive resuscitation and needs to autodiuresis. And again, autodiuresis comes when the proteins in the blood and the vessels uh, have sealed and the oncotic pressure rises and, you know, they start urinating. You don't want to give somebody who's already gone through a big resuscitation and who's now starting to give back fluid, you don't want to give them more fluid. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So then I, I, those are the patients I tend to increase the concentration of the enteral feeds um, and see what we can do about keeping fluid, you know, minimal fluid going in. Okay. Um, so starting off on the brat diet and you do that for a day or two, do you then start yeah. incorporating some kind of protein with that or? Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think one of the, one of the great ways of doing that down range is to, you know, get them protein powder um, and mix that in there. Uh, so they do have the proteins and fats. So the other, the other thing that I wanted to add uh, was we never um, discuss like parameters, like, well, how much, uh, protein is good protein. And in general, in these patients who are stressed, um, should get somewhere in the vicinity upwards of one and a half to two uh, kilocalories per kilo per day. So that's how you can judge how much. We talked about goal two feeds. We talked about it in the, in the um, framework of milliliters an hour. Uh, but again, the importance is how many uh, um, you know, ki calories per kilo per hour is needed. So I wanted to, I wanted to give you that framework for protein and then calories. Um, this would be in the order of five to six grams per kilo per day in the form of lipids and carbohydrates. Uh, it's where they should get their calories. And then um, non-protein uh Calories again, a framework would be anywhere from 25 to 30 kilocalories per kilo per day. In calories, you want to just use calories. So, um, so anyway, I just wanted to bring that around to, to those numbers uh, because of the medics who are taking care of these patients um, need that kind of guideline to uh, to calculate how much protein powder, if you will. Uh, to put in their fluids and their NG tubes or OG tubes, uh, however they're delivering it to their patients, just orally um, would need. Um, now, how do we? How do you assess? So I can obviously um, I'm giving them. Let's say I'm giving them 20 mLs an hour, and I've been doing it for a day, and he hasn't thrown up yet. Um, the ball the what do I, what am I doing for an assessment other than, you know, he hasn't puked, so I must be doing good. Um, am I just continuing that uh, assessment for bowel sounds and looking for a distended abdomen? Um, you know, how do I know I'm yeah. moving in the right direction? Yeah. So, uh, it's not going to be measured over minutes or hours. It's going to be measured over days and weeks. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's the hard thing for us to understand sometimes. Um, and it's, it's also measured by the things that are not happening. In other words, they're not getting pneumonia. Um, they're not getting decubitus ulcers or soft tissue injuries. They're, um, they are, uh, you know, they're getting enough energy uh, 
to do things like swing their legs over the cot or um, stay awake for longer periods of time. Um, that, that's how you're going to measure. All of these things come in very, very prolonged uh, clinical victories, um, like the things I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you may not know. The early things like bowel sounds and platus and stool and so forth, those are somewhat measurable in the order of hours, but, but uh, I wouldn't expect, I, I wouldn't change anything, make any drastic changes without a series of victories or losses, you know, mm-hmm. dur- during that period. Okay. So generally it's, you're more holding fast with your plan until, um, you know, you start seeing some kind of distension or, or yep. something like that, right? Yeah. Type if right? they vomit, stop. If they don't vomit and they're getting distended, I would stop. Okay. And if they're not, if they don't vomit and they're not getting distended, uh, but they're not having bowel movements or flatus, uh, I would keep going. Okay. Yeah, very good. Um, I don't know. Is there Dennis, anything there else? Is, there is one. Yeah. Okay. There, there is. There is. And the only reason why, well, there's a couple of reasons why I want to bring it up. One uh, is is the visual and and um, and pulling from from memory. But many of your readers have seen uh, the movie uh, um, Band of Brothers. Mm-hmm. And I think you and I have spoken about this when we've uh, done our prolonged field care exercises, um, uh, you know, to the teams that, that uh, get their training at Ragged Edge. We talk about nutrition and we refer to that scene in Band of Brothers where the American troops uh, walk into a concentration camp and they're ordered to give them water and bread and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the, uh, you know, the battalion surgeon comes by and says, Oh, stop feeding them, stop feeding them. And it makes no sense to anybody. Right. And they're like, what do you mean? They're starving to death. These patients are cachectic. Um, They're feeble. They're in, you know, stages of dying. And the one thing that they need is nutrition. And many people in the audience do not understand withholding the nutrition. And basically what that gets to is that, yes, these patients are starving, but if you, if you uh, feed these patients uh, food um, high in calories, in particular carbohydrates like bread, mm-hmm. um, what happens is uh, it changes the way the cells take in nutrition and depletes the cells of phosphorus. And that phosphorus um, will, um, when depleted um, in a very complex biochemical reaction, um, take away energy and they can go into severe respiratory failure. And we call that refeeding syndrome. Refeeding syndrome is uh, is a is actually a fairly dramatic. It can be fairly dramatic, where when these patients are introduced to uh, carbohydrates, in particular after prolonged starvation period, um, they go into respiratory failure and ultimately into multi-system organ failure if not identified early enough. So the you know battalion surgeon made the right uh, gave the correct order do not feed those patients they will need to be resuscitated but they will have to have their electrolytes followed very closely Mm -hmm. now we see this in the hospital from time to time in patients who have had prolonged periods of starvation either it's iatrogenically introduced meaning the the doctors have said don't feed them and they really did need nutrition or maybe it's self-induced, right, with psychiatric patients, uh, or a combination of just, you know, really bad things happening and the patient has not had their nutrition. Cancer is another one. Mm -hmm. Um, And we try and feed them because we know that early nutrition is important. And uh, we put them in a refeeding syndrome. They go to the ICU, they get intubated, and now we got to start from zero. And uh, a lot of that can be, so it, it can be predicted, um, but, um, but it should always be anticipated or at least um, 
well, I guess anticipated is the right word. If they have the history of not eating, um, then um, you have to be aware of this repeating syndrome. And then the other thing I really want to touch on, Dennis, um, many of your audience members may understand the Krebs cycle and the function of the mitochondrion to generate energy in the form of ATP. And that ATP is the, is the story of how sugar uh, or glycolysis is used uh, to generate energy in the form of phosphates. And that's why, that's how you can complete the story uh, of um, uh, refeeding syndrome where uh, phosphate um, and, and, or phosphorus rather um, is depleted and therefore your energy stores go low and the ability to breathe um, is impaired uh, by refeeding. So um, I think the important message is on the macro level, not on the micro level, uh, but again, it just enhances a greater understanding uh, and um, provides the information um, that uh, glucose should definitely be used despite the emphasis for proteins and fats uh, to uh, provide that energy because eventually they're broken down um, in their most elemental level uh, to provide the substrate for glycolysis. What kind of timelines are you talking about for the refeeding syndrome? I mean, it's not, it's not like a day, day or two. Day. No, 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 no. We're talking really prolonged fasting. We're talking kind of past the seven day mark mm -hmm. where you're getting close to the 14. Okay. You know, your body's really, really starving. So you can be fat and malnourished, right? right. Uh, I don't think you're allowed to say fat anymore in this world. You That's definitely okay. can't. Nobody say listens eat. anyway. So <laughs> you can be, uh, you can meet the uh, insurance requirements for a high BMI and be obese and still starve. <laughs> Yeah. You laugh, but you would be surprised at the things you get called out for. Right. Yeah. We're, we're very sensitive. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so anyway, um, uh, so, so my point is, is yes, uh, your body can be starving and yet you can weigh more than the insurance companies allow you. Yeah. And you could go into refeeding syndrome. Uh, but, um, in general, those patients uh, will start drawing from their, you know, fat stores, mm -hmm. muscle stores. Um, the big shock are these cachectic patients, and um, that's when we get the refeeding um, that is so clinically significant that they end up in the ICU, and you get, you know, you have to give them boluses of potassium and phosphorus to keep their the machine of the body going. Mm -hmm. The last, the last point I want, I want to make, uh, because this is such an important topic, is one that um, is one that is discussed in clinical rounds uh, in a in a in a resource rich environment. Um, meaning, we're not talking downrange in some in some uh, hut in some unknown village. Uh, we're talking about a hospital that has capabilities of measuring um, important uh, important um, um, contents of the blood, and that is the concept of these acute phase proteins to see if a patient is nutritionally replete or not, uh, replete meaning replenished, uh, and, uh, and that is, uh, the acute phase proteins of albumin, prealbumin, transferrin, retinal binding protein, and so forth. These are, these are proteins in the blood that people often refer to, to see if their levels are high enough such that, um, they are nutritionally starving. Mm. So if you think about a patient that needs to be in a hospital, there's probably a reason. Right. Right. And that reason can be anything from injury to um, infectious uh, reasons of various sorts, um, trauma, um, 
you know, the need for surgery, things like that. What happens when there's inflammation is these acute phase proteins, retinal binding protein, transferrin, albumin and prealbumin. People love to talk about albumin and prealbumin um, as being markers of nutrition. Unfortunately, um, this cannot be a more um, erroneous goose chase. So when you have inflammation, when you have trauma, when you have illness, when you have infectious disease, when you have fistula, when you have um, ad nauseum, you pick, um, it drives these acute phase proteins down very quickly. Mm-hmm. And so um, even when, they're, when their uh, levels are low, that doesn't mean that they're nutritionally replete. That, that just means that there's enough inflammation uh, that those numbers are down. So what many people will refer to is, well, um, we need to feed them because their mortality is high if their nutrition is low. And the answer is you're absolutely correct. We do need to feed them. Right. The metabolic demand is super high, but because those numbers are low, um, has nothing, has very, very little, if anything to do with nutrition. Yes. In a, in a, in a patient who's at home, who's cachectic, yes, those numbers will be low. That's yes, absolutely. But just because there's inflammation, those numbers will be low as well. And yet they have a history of being totally normal, totally healthy before they got in a car crash. So if you, if you start getting those numbers and they're low, does that mean that they weren't eating or they're nutritionally starving? The answer is absolutely not. Right. What that goes to say is we should feed our patients in a timely fashion. In general, those patients are, should be fed, um, all things being equal, within 24 to 36 hours. There are those patients who will fall out of that, and those are patients who have um, a disrupted um, gut. For some reason, you don't have to feed those patients right away because you may be adding to their morbidity. Um, but those are the one-offs. Right. Right. Now, I guess when you're, I guess, kind of quantify disruption, like you, like uh, somebody has, you know, small holes through the abdomen, uh, will they feed those patients or not? No. Nope. They need some type of definitive treatment before you feed them because okay. all you're doing is promoting more fluid spillage into yep. the abdomen or into the atmosphere. Okay. All right. So essentially the cutoff is if, as long as they have an intact GI system, um, they've been resuscitated um, and you've put some kind of you know safety measures in place as far as reducing the risk for aspiration. Uh, there's no real great reason to not uh, try to start feeding um, within, you know, in 24 hours. Correct. Is that, okay. No, yeah, absolutely awesome. Um, oh, is there anything else you can think of? Um, I don't. I think we hit on most of the main topics, Dennis. Um, as you can gather, uh, the, the discussion surrounding nutrition is absolutely enormous. Mm-hmm. That's probably mostly because we don't know all the answers yet. Uh, but it has far reaching implications. Uh, you know, the specifics around the head injury or the burn patient or the cancer patient, uh, or, you know, or the patient who's just, uh, lacking the ability to get fed directly. Um, you could go on ad nauseum about all these issues, including just plain fluids alone. Right. So I, I, hopefully we, we at least, uh, we didn't confuse anybody and hopefully we pointed folks into a, a, a stronger direction, uh, built their intuition up and, and their confidence in approaching nutrition in these, uh, in the patients that they'll encounter. I mean, everybody, you know, you have at least some kind of a uh, human connection, some kind of emotion. And you know that when you're feeling hungry, you're wondering, I wonder if this patient is also hungry. Um, you know, I feel like I need to do something about it, but I'm, I don't know, you know? So, um, I think at least by giving some kind of education in 
uh, the good and the bad about it. Um, you know, what kind of assessments to find out if this is the right patient for that type of uh, intervention um, and how to do it and how to assess if you're doing the, the right thing or not. Um, you know, I think I, I really doubt you're going to hurt somebody that much if um, you start off at, you know, 10 or 20 mLs in an hour. Um, you know, if they start, if they start to descend, then you stop. I mean, really at that point, and you already have an NG tube in, if you're really concerned that you're going the wrong direction to suck it back out. Uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's a very reasonable approach. I would agree. Okay. Well, cool. Hey, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dennis. It's always a pleasure working with you and, and certainly, uh, these podcasts, uh, have, uh, just, they're just invaluable to, to your listeners and I get feedback from it. Uh, uh, I'm sure like you do. And, uh, it's great to know that there's folks out there like you, um, asking these great questions. All right. Well, thank you. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Out. Hurry, boy, it's waiting there for you.